Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. This is the valley, a vanished world from a forgotten time. Here on the Welsh borders lies a remarkable farm, one that is trapped in time, restored to how it would have been in the reign of James I, the year 1620. Here, a unique project has been taking place. Five hand-picked experts have been running it as it would have been 400 years ago. Working without any modern conveniences, they've been toiling to make the farm work for a full calendar year. Through the months and seasons, they've turned the clock back to rediscover a way of life from an age gone by. Now their time's up. August marks the end of the agricultural year and their very last month in the valley. It's August, our 12th and final month here on the farm. And 400 years ago, this really would have been crunch time for a farmer. We've got the most enormous amount to do. Provided the weather holds, we've got to get out in the fields and cut the grain, stook it, dry it, bring it all in. The wheat harvest has always been a real race against time. The team ploughed, sowed and harrowed this field back in their very first month, September. No one was quite sure how the grain would do. A year later and it's standing almost fully ripe, a glorious golden yellow. Now all they have to do is cut it down. As was traditional in the harvest, they've brought in some extra manpower. Stuart's sons, Graham and Ian. Yes, again, we've got no idea exactly how this would have been done. I mean, Alex and I have both been consulting the sources, and we've, we've given it a lot of thought and a lot of debate. And, um, I mean, there's a number of theories, aren't there? Well, yeah, there are. I mean, some of the illustrations, for example, you've got these guys depicted as kneeling down. It looks like they're cutting right at the bottom. There's also some useful material in Gervais Markham's books on how to run your estate. Markham is recommending leaving 18 inches of stubble, and part of the reason for this is that if you took the whole of the crop off, you've only got the same amount of grain, which is what you're really after, but you've got twice as much bulk. And that means you need twice as much barn space, which was often a limiting factor for the farmers of the period. The team are using replicas of period hooks or sickles. At first, I thought that it was going to be a case of slashing it with the, like we did with the grass hooks, but it's not the case. These sickles, in fact, they've, uh, they've got serrated edges. So what I'm doing is just getting hold of a handful and just tearing the sickle around the edge of it. And of course, in doing that, I'm not agitating the head of the wheat and therefore shaking out the grain. Boys, when you're making these piles behind you, could you make sure all the heads face in the same direction? Is that all right, so that all the heads lay the same way and not some one way and some the other? Thank you. As was normal for women at the time, Ruth and Chloe are heavily involved in the wheat harvest, bundling up the cut grain. Although it's relentless work, it marks a final high point in their work on the farm. It's lovely for us to be involved in this last big agricultural push of the year. It's, it's wonderful. It gives you a real sense of achievement and of, sort of finality, in a way. It's really so, all hands to the pump, too, it isn't is, it? Yeah. Absolutely everybody got involved in harvest time. Yeah. Men, women and children. It does get it done quicker as well. It's the reason that they have um, academic terms that, like they do. You know, even to this day, we all still have the sort of harvest period off from schools and things, and that was originally so that all the students and pupils could be out in the fields. <laughs> With so much time pressure involved in cutting the wheat, women also helped sickle it down, 
But while mail mowers earned about eight pennies a day, women were paid about six pennies. In a hand I'm finding the heat, John. It's, uh, it's humidity's a bit blah. Yeah. But we're making good progress. Yeah. This field is about just over half an acre. So they normally reckon that a man could clear this field on his own in half a day. But uh, they were a lot fitter and more experienced at it than we are. But he'd have started at seven and they'd often reckon not to finish the day's cutting until the, uh, the light went. Six hours in and the team are slowly getting there. They're about halfway through the field. This is the make or break point of the agricultural year, really. The grain is the staple. It's the basic food stuff. It's the thing that lasts you right through the winter. And if you have a rubbish grain harvest, then you're in quite serious bother. So it would have been quite an anxious time for a farmer 400 years ago. This period variety of wheat stands up to five feet high, much taller than modern varieties. But there are some spots where it's very thin and stunted. As much as I'd like to blame it on the uh, fertility of the soil and the fact that it isn't really the right kind of area to grow wheat, I feel it's probably got more to do with my uh, somewhat clumsy sowing technique. With everyone hard at work in the field, there's no one left over to cook up a hearty meal. So they're making do with a simple picnic. <laughs> oh, look, we have a visitor. Don't chase it. Almost marks the end of the year, doesn't it? Mm. Wheat crop in. Absolutely. Harvest home's what we're waiting for. Mm. <laughs> Get there soon. This big, critical task has brought everyone together. It's back-breaking work, but they're well on their way to completing their last big project on the farm. It's nearing the end of the day, but there's still plenty to do. All the bundled wheat has to be stood up in stooks so it can dry in the sun and air. Fresh August morning in the valley. Time for Ruth and Chloe to take out the geese. I don't think I like having Minky around behind them, actually. Come here, you. Have you seen we've got walnuts? We've also got geese in the front! Not in there! Well, we shan't need to water them for a while. No, no, well, they were getting a bit warm. We've had a bit of a disaster, really. Well, it's not that much of a disaster, but the geese saw an opportunity to slip through and get into the pond, and it being a hot day, and they're all in there. I'm not quite sure how we can. Get I have out. a theory. Yeah. I have this stick here that I think Minky wants. Minky, you can get it. Fetch it. That's it, Minx. Good, Good Mink. Well done, that dog. Good boy. Fantastic. You're a star. Come on, pop. Minky. Oh, Come on, puppy. That's it, puppy geese. Come. Back. Once again, Alex, Fonz and Stuart have called on Blackthorn to help pull the hay sledge. Once the wheat stooks have had a good chance to air and dry, they need to be brought in as quickly as possible. Not only is the grain safe to put in at this point, but also a lot of the weeds have dried off. You can see the greens all going very, very pale. We've got a lot of odd bits and pieces in here because we're not sort of spraying to kill off all the weeds. So that will be vetch. Sometimes it was grown as a crop because uh, it would provide good animal fodder. It's like a, a little lupin or pea, but that we'll sort out later. It's not the work that's a problem for Blackthorn. She's used to pulling heavy loads. Um, she was a pit pony. It's the standing around doing nothing. I mean, while we're standing here, we're just getting bitten to pieces by the horse flies. She's played up a little bit, but she's, she's got a bit calmer now. 
Compared to Stooks of the period, ours are actually quite small, but they've been extremely successful. When we cut the wheat the other day, there were tiny little green tips on the ends of the ears here, but they've now turned under this lovely August sun, a gorgeous golden yellowy brown. But they're not too dry, so that when we're moving them, shaking them around, we're not dropping the grain out. So I think we've got it just right this time. There would usually have been a range of poultry on a 17th century farm. Chickens peck up bits of grain and insects. Ducks hoover up slugs and caterpillars in the garden. And geese are useful for trimming down grass. August was a traditional month to take geese up to the wheat field to eat any spilt grain. Two reasons for that. Um, one is we don't actually want any grain to self-seed in the field. We want to clear it off, and that way we won't run the risk of diseases carrying from one year to the next. And the other reason, of course, is to fatten up the geese. It's a, a good time of year to be fattening them up, ready for Michaelmas, which was the traditional time to eat goose. There's good geese. Up to the field, get nice and fat. With their first load of wheat stooks tied on the sledge, the boys can start bringing it in. Even with Blackthorn's help, it's going to take them a number of runs to clear the field. They're going to store it in their grain barn. The wheat had to last the farm almost a whole year, so the barn's conditions were critical. We've laid out a carpet of really spiky gorse on our, uh, on our barn floor. It's lovely and bouncy, it's about six inches thick and it lets the air flow underneath, and of course it keeps the wheat off the floor so it doesn't get damp. But the main reason for the gorse is to act as a deterrent for um, mice and rats that want to eat our grain, because obviously it'll be uh, very spiky against their little noses as they try and burrow in. Up in the stubble field, the geese are settling in, gobbling up any leftovers on the ground and the girls are having a very arduous time of it. This has been one of the more interesting things we've done, really, because I've not done anything like this before. It is, you're right, it's nice to get out and do the harvesting. It must have been absolutely terrifying keeping your eye on the weather. I mean, that's what these stooks are for, isn't it? It's a sort of like, you know, hanging on for the last bit of, of summer sun you can possibly get on it, but you've got it in a form that, should the heavens open, you can whisk it inside. I think it's getting even muggier, isn't it? But we look like we've beaten the rain. The geese seem to be enjoying themselves. They do. They seem quite happy. They've gone all quiet. Look at them. Yeah. Nine hours in, and Stuart and Alex are loading up the very last stooks of wheat, ready for the final run down to the grain barn. We've only grown one small field of wheat here. Back in the early 17th century, even a small upland farm like this would have grown more wheat, and then they'd have had barley, oats, probably rye as well on top of that. But it's also a case that the upland farms would have been more emphasizing the livestock side of their operations, so the grains would have been a smaller proportion of what they did compared to the lowland farms. Right, that's tight on there. Okay. All this standing around, loading and unloading, has been a real test of Blackthorn's patience. But she's done well. Can't walk on. <laughs> she's got used to standing still. She has. Just, just, just Come back smack on. Walk on. Walk on. That's a good girl. You're going to have to overhaul the sledge before uh, next year, that's for sure. Yeah, it's going to need a few repairs, isn't it? Yeah, I think that runner's split on the other side. That's going to have to come off and be completely... But it's last of the year, though, isn't it? Watch out, Pond. Damn it. Go on, walk on. Walk on. Walk on. Fortunately, the weather has held, and all the grain is now down from go. the field. The barn is slowly filling up. Well, there we go. 
Well, 400 years ago, that would be the next 12 months bread corn for them. So, I'm glad I'm not having to live off this for another 12 months. I don't think we've got enough here, but if we'd done a few more fields, we could have done. Yeah. It's about just over half an acre of wheat was actually planted in there when you take off the edges. It's amazing how much it's filled up the barn. That was September we started with that, wasn't it? That was indeed, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sowing it all down, ploughing it. It's done yeah. well. It's done very it's well. It's a good long time, 12 months. <laughs> The end of August, and the team's final day on the farm. Which means time's up for one of the stubble-fed geese. A goose has got a lot of uses, not just eggs during life and meat when it's dead. The feathers on this wing will make writing quills. I'm right-handed. This stretches back away from my face over my wrist. If I was using the other wing, then it would stick the other way and it would be getting up my nose, which would be a real nuisance. While one wing could be used for writing quills, the other was frequently used in a farmhouse as a duster brush. But it was the small breast feathers that were most precious. The light fluffy down is far more valuable, although you get less of it. And those would have been sold at the period to the gentry from many farms before they've got enough for their pillows or if they're really rich, even for mattresses. One final task remains for Alex and Fons in the wheat field. All the stubble left after cutting the grain has to be scythed down and brought in. Go, then. I fancy scything today. The straw stems had a number of valuable benefits. It could be used for thatching, as fuel for burning, or as bedding for animals. This would have been the last job in the agricultural calendar. It's also going to be our last job on the farm. And I'm really going to miss this place. I've been here for 12 months, and um, I've always studied history by reading about it in books. But uh, there's such an amazing difference between reading and actually getting out there and doing it. And it really has been an eye opener. Brilliant education, but it is hard work. While the boys sweat in the field, Ruth and Chloe are getting on with an important seasonal task, making rush lights, assisted by expert candle maker David Constable. Back in the 17th century, Summer was the time, really, to be gathering these rushes in. They're nice and lush, full of growth, as big as they get, and you need to gather them when they're still green, so it's no good trying to do it in the winter. So at some point in the summer, somebody in the family has to find time to prepare them. Not only were the rushes a free local resource, so too was the material they had to be dipped in to make them into rush lights. Animal fat, or tallow. The qualities of tallow would vary immensely from different animals and even a ewe and a sheep. A tallow chandler or a tallow candle maker would have known his fats very well and known where to go on the animal and just looked at the carcass and known what he could use and what he couldn't. Dipped into a cauldron of molten tallow, the summer-cut rushes soak up the fat, storing it to be burned for light. Mid-morning and Fonz and Alex are doing well, but it's hot, unrelenting work. Back in the beginning of winter, I was quite concerned that the clothes wouldn't be warm enough, you know, just this linen top and that doublet. And the breeches, not only going down to the knees, but, yeah, it was a pleasant surprise to find that they're actually really quite warm to work in. And yet now... Now you're being punished. Been punished, yeah. Oh God! While rush lights were the cheapest light source on a farm, they did also have candles. Without electricity, both were absolutely vital. If you could afford candles, you used candles. Candles last longer. They're easier to use. You don't have to fiddle with them all the time, um, and they just—they smell better too. <laughs> but they do cost quite a lot of money in, comp you know, in comparison to free. 
the candle maker would charge something like sixpence a day if you if you fed him and gave him wine and beer and stuff, or ninepence if you didn't. And uh, you'd stay there for make as many candles as you as you wanted, and uh, then move on to the next house. With wax, these would build up quite quickly, but with tallow, which is such a soft fat, it would most probably take something like a hundred dips to get this to a to about an inch or so. The most expensive candles were made of beeswax. A farm like this would probably have only used them on special occasions. We've got glass we make a lot of them in, you know, we pour them in moulds a lot nowadays. Oh, right. So rather we, than yeah, rather all than being just dipping it up. I hadn't thought that, but yeah. Indoors in the hall, Stuart is planning a slap up harvest dinner with goose pie as the centrepiece. The oldest copy of this recipe occurs in a book called The uh, Good Huswife's Jewel, written in uh, 1596 by Thomas Dawson. With the goose boned, the meat needs to be parboiled in a boiling cauldron over the fire. Carrots at this period came in a whole variety of colours. These are white. There are Dutch paintings even of purple carrots, uh, as well as the normal orange ones that we expect nowadays. The dish we're going to do is a carrot puree. You make them into a mush with vinegar, and in the more upper-class recipes, you'd add currants and sugar as well. I'm using a bell metal skillet Bell metal is a type of bronze, and it does tell us that they must have kept their kitchenware pretty clean, because if you allow it um, to sit there and fester, you develop little green, bluey green spots on it, which are verdigris, which is highly toxic. So uh, cleanliness was definitely a feature of their kitchens. At the end of the day, Ruth, Chloe and David can finally try out their rushlights. Well, don't get your hopes up too high. They do have a habit of blowing out. <laughs> They're useful, but, you know, you don't want to have to rely on them too much, if you know what I mean. This is a rushlight holder, sort of a specialist bit of equipment, really. Um, they found loads of these archaeologically, and you can see it's just a sort of pair of jaws, really, that clamps the rush at any angle you choose to put it. You're going to have to watch the uh, angle of this, I think, so it's going to maybe peter out. In the... It's not bad, is it? It's quite a reasonable light. It's brilliant. I was yeah. not expecting it to actually burn. I was expecting sort of a weedy little... No, you get a decent light off them, don't you? A recent discovery in the 1600s enabled candlelight to be magnified for close, detailed work. So, in 1613, they developed the candle condenser, which was a ball of um, glass full of water, and it magnified the light of the, of the candle. So, if you're working on lace there, I don't know if you can see that. Ooh. That's amazing. It's, that I love the way good, it's, like, it? pointed. So you can actually direct, <laughs> like, a really neat little stab of light at it. They would have, like, a stand of uh, these uh, condensers with, say, four on, and four lace makers would sit round and... Um, be working under these lights, these little spotlights. With the goose cooked, it's time to stuff it into a rustic pie case. Except on special occasions, this would have been seasoned at the period with Alexander seeds in a farm situation rather than black pepper. It was cheap, well, free, they could grow it in the gardens, whereas pepper from the Indies was very expensive. The pie needs to be packed out with butter, and the lid put on, ready for baking in the bread oven. And here we have a pie, as it would have been 400 years ago. Some things are as certain now as they were 400 years ago, and in a British summer, that means rain. I tell you what, mate, I'm absolutely exhausted. Yeah. This harvest has pretty much wiped me out, has to be said. Get your fitness levels back, boy. After this morning, it was so hot that the straw, well, it was like really crispy and goldeny. So it was ideal for taking into the cart shed. If we could have just got it in just before this rain, perfect, done and dusted. But sadly not. No. In sadly came no. the rain. Spoilt our, our little fantasy. 
But if it gets too wet, we may actually have to rake it out again and wait for it to dry and go through the whole procedure again if we're to use this straw for bedding or fuel on the farm. Yeah. Now you're well into boots. Well, my feet are still roasting hot, mind. With the stubble getting more and more sodden, Alex and Fonz have to abandon it to the elements. I think we had a tumble dryer. And retire inside where dinner awaits. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe just half. You got a hacksaw? <laughs> yeah. Not gonna eat ever again, did you say? He's <laughs> not eating the pastry, so it's smaller than it looks. The wheat harvest is now safely in store. The make or break project in the agricultural calendar has been a success. Sorry, I'm late. Where have you been? I've been putting some tools away. Oh, right. yeah, if it's the sustenance of life. Well, we've left you a Talk bit. About the sustenance of life. Yes. This will be the team's very last meal in the valley. What began a year ago as a unique project to rediscover how a farm was worked in the 17th century is now complete. So what have we, what have we got here then? That's this carrot puree done with white carrots, mm -hmm. which is what we had in one of the rows in the garden. Wonderful. And then it's got butter in it and vinegar as well. 12 months of effort and labor have transformed this site into a farm that looks and functions as it would have done during the reign of James I. From building projects to cookery, ancient technology to period breeds of animals, our experts have gained a unique insight into a lost world and a forgotten time. By putting into practice what others only write about, the team have taken us to the very heart of people's lives 400 years ago. One of the great things about period jobs is that although at first glance they may seem to be very boring and repetitive and you're doing them hour after hour through the day, things like dry stone walling where you're banging the rocks together, fiddling with them all the time to find that mix, at the end of it you stand back and there's another couple of yards across the landscape. It's very, very satisfying. I think the thing I've enjoyed most about this year is the chance to really practice at things and get reasonably good at them. Cheese making, for example, I started off having done a few little goes but not being that great at it. And I've done so much that my cheese making has improved and improved and improved. I really make quite tasty stuff now. <laughs> Come on, gorgeous. Come. I think I'm really going to miss working with the animals. I've built up quite a close working relationship with them, especially Blackthorn. And uh, I think because they're period rare breeds, they have this much more natural character because they haven't been as intensively reared. I'm going to miss them, these characters that have provided company for us for a year. It's, uh, it's going to be a wrench leaving, I think. We've been on this farm for 12 months, and one of the last things I thought I'd be doing is building projects. But they've been a necessity. We've had three to do, a cow shed, a privy and a hovel. We've built them, we've risen to the challenge, and they're still standing. They're our mark on the farm. And I think they were the things that gave me my biggest sense of achievement. I think if one thing stands out, it's not necessarily working here in the 17th century, but working here in the countryside amongst nature. And I'm really going to struggle to drag myself out of this beautiful rural setting back into the 21st century. So has everyone got their mugs full, yeah? Yeah. Certainly, okay, yeah, well I think so. we should raise a toast to a fantastic year on the valley, yeah? I'll second yeah. that. Okay. What's hail? Drink, Drink hail. hail.